If you have a guy whose anger isn't under control, he's not happy. You can't be happy if your relationships are a mess. If you have a woman who's constantly critical or negative, she's not happy. Uh, if you have somebody who's addicted, there might be moments of pleasure, but it's about compulsion. It's not about freedom. It's not about happiness. And so it's not in doing that, putting holiness against happiness. It's just saying that Jesus told us yes. the most successful life, the most fulfilling life, Matthew 6, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Yes. Jesus isn't referring to marriage in Matthew 6, but if people would apply it, it's going to lead to the happiest of marriages. The problem is we want happiness without dealing with our anger, without dealing with our materialism, without dealing with our negativity or all, all of those other issues. And, and we can't because those things make us miserable. Welcome to the Intertwined Life Podcast. I am your host, Jenny Zentz. I am a wife and a mom on a mission. I've got a passion to help women discover practical ways to apply the power of God's word to our everyday stuff. I truly believe that our walks with the Lord should be seamlessly intertwined with our everyday lives. It should affect every move we make and every breath we take. So come on, let's do life together. You've got this, cause he's got you. All right, guys, I'm so excited that you have tuned in for this episode. Whether you are killing this marriage thing or this marriage thing is killing you, today is your day. I had the incredible privilege of sitting down over Zoom for an hour and a half for a one-on-one -on -one with Mr. Gary Thomas. Gary Thomas is incredible. If you do not know who he is, you probably know his work. Gary Thomas is a best-selling author of over 20 books. One of them that really put him on the map is Sacred Marriage. It is an incredible book. There's devotions. He travels around the country doing conferences based on that book, as well as many other things. And that is actually how I first learned about Gary over 10 years ago, almost 10 years ago. Tim and I were at a conference and it was his conference and it rocked my world. It changed the course of our marriage. I have no doubt. And I was so thankful for it. And who could have dreamed that 10 years later, I would be having an hour and a half conversation, just he and I over Zoom because who even knew what Zoom was, right? So I hope you're going to enjoy this. I know that you will. You are going to find practical, powerful tools that you can put into practice in your marriage right now, regardless of how things are going. I know that you're going to love Gary as much as I do. So enjoy this episode. Mr. Gary Thomas, welcome to the Intertwined Life Podcast. Well, thank you for having me on, Jenny. I'm so excited to have you. And every time I say your name, I kind of have a little nostalgic. My maiden name is actually Thomas. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> so every time I say that, I'm just like, oh, what? Um, so why don't you just, if anyone listening doesn't know who you are, I've already done an introduction, of course, but just yeah. share from your own perspective who you really are and your life story and what brought you to what you do and how you got here. Yeah, well, I've... I've been a writer for most of my adult life. Um, I have three grown children, two grandchildren. I was on the teaching team of a large church in Houston, Texas until last fall. Okay. And I'm moving into another church here in a couple months in a different state. Uh, writing books on how we get closer to Christ and closer to others. Most people are more familiar with the books about getting closer to others, i.e. the marriage books, because yes. they just tend to sell a little, <laughs> but uh, I, I really just have this passion <laughs> my whole life uh, for Jesus, for marriages, helping people grow closer to their God, closer to each other. Uh, yeah. It's, it's what wakes me up when I'm excited to talk. about. It. Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, I love it. He gives us these passions, right? And that's kind of how I am too. My whole thing is just helping people realize how we can put the power of God's word into our everyday lives. And I'm very passionate. Sometimes it gets me in trouble, <laughs> but I hear you. And I love it that he planted that seed and you just for full force went for it and you are still going for it. So man, what is your degree? Are you a psychologist? No. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Guys. Uh, I, I got a degree in English literature. I wanted to be a writer my whole life, gotcha. Jenny. And the key is getting paid to do it. It's like being a <laughs> photographer, a painter, or a singer. 
everybody does it a little bit. Everybody probably dreams of being one of those, but just being able to get, get paid. And yeah. so I actually wrote Sacred Marriage, which is my first marriage book. Yes. Uh, and the best selling one out of a desire to help people grow spiritually. I'd written three books on spiritual growth. Mm -hmm. And then I noticed that probably what God used to help me most to grow spiritually was my marriage. Mm, it's such seeing a catalyst. My sin revealed, learning to relate to another person, all of those things. I'd never seen somebody deal with marriage from that perspective. I, I, I don't mm -hmm. have a PhD, so I couldn't write your traditional marriage book about, well, I, I just don't have the expertise or the study or knowledge to do mm -hmm. that. So what, what happened, it was really my limitation that helped sacred marriage to do so well because it was so different. I talked about the difficulties of marriage. I think every yeah. marriage in its own way has its own share of difficulties. But God can use those difficulties Amen. Amen. to help us grow and become more like Christ. Mm -hmm. Oh, so I want to stop you right there. You're getting me so excited. So your, that book, Sacred Marriage, I love exactly what you're saying. And and I think I put this on your notes, but in the spring of 2013, so it's kind of hard to believe it's been almost 10 years, wow. you did a conference at Reston Bible Church in Northern Virginia, just outside yeah. DC, very close to Dulles Airport. Uh, the pastor, Mike Mentor, a lot of people will know his daughter, mm -hmm. Kelly Mentor, author, speaker. So we loved that church. That was our church for um, several years until we actually relocated our family to Florida in 2014. But you did this conference. And so my husband and I actually, at the time people are listening to this, it will already happen. But on April 8th, this year is our 16th wedding anniversary. So yay. Yeah. We're excited about that. But at this time we were, let's see, 2006 to whatever that was. So we were not at that even, you know, 10 year mark. We were around year seven, that seven year itch that I talk about, yes. right? So our start to marriage had been a, just what you're saying. I love what you're saying. I feel like Marriage was a catalyst for so many things, and I'd love to get your thoughts on this, but we met, met and married in seven months, oh. and but we knew. We were out of college. We were both ready for that, and we were at that point, and we knew. We did not have a very good start to marriage. The first several years were really hard. And I often say that we didn't hit the honeymoon phase until year seven, <laughs> you know, like those first few years. And we didn't have kids for about three and a half years. So it wasn't that. But what happened was exactly what you said. It showed me and also showed Tim my issues and my struggles and some of the past that I needed to be healed from in a way that no other relationship could. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we got married too soon because I firmly do not believe that some of those issues and struggles that I had, and, and, you know, I'm sure he had his too, would not have come to the surface without the catalyst of marriage. Absolutely. Right. I, it's what I found. Cause I had going through college, I had a new roommate every year, you know, yeah. pretty yeah. much. Yeah. Uh, and if you have an issue with the roommate, you have to deal with it. You're like, well, I've got somebody else next September. What's the big deal? I'm going to be <laughs> with my parents for the summer. It's no big deal. But suddenly with marriage, mm -hmm. this is the rest of my life because <laughs> mm -hmm. I was determined that the divorce wasn't going to be an option for us. Yes. And so, yeah, I was having to deal with things and I saw a side of myself oh. I just never knew existed. And, you know, Jenny, I've seen some people where their marriages haven't made it and, and they'll talk to me and, and it's sort of like they did things and said things in their first marriage and they say, that can't be me mm -hmm. it must have been the other person drawn oh. out of because they're so ashamed they're so embarrassed they're thinking that yeah. can't be me until they find out in their second marriage mm -hmm. it it was them yeah. uh, but, but see this is what i love about pursuing christ and marriage together because of christ we can have the courage to face our sin because jesus has said i've made provision for that yeah. you, you're not as holy as you thought you were. I wasn't. I, I was a lot more <laughs> immature. I was a lot more selfish than I really yes. realized. But Jesus says, but come to me. Don't run from it. Confess it. I'll give you my Holy Spirit. I'll give you the power to overcome it. But mm -hmm. repentance implies turning around. The problem is a lot of us don't think we need to turn around. Mm -hmm. and, and it's why I tell young people when they're looking for someone to marry, don't underestimate the value of humility. Yeah. Um, you know, people are looking at six pack abs, they're looking at <laughs> hair, they're looking at, but 
the, the thing of humility, if you marry an arrogant person, mm. every time there's an issue in marriage, they're thinking you need to get your act together. Yeah. They're not looking at their own stuff. They're not guarding their own heart. They're not challenging their own heart. It's sort of much, pretty much you get your act together and then we'll be okay. Mm -hmm. That's really going to limit a marriage if both people don't see this as a chance to grow in holiness. Yes. Yes. And so I love what you said, because that's exactly what our story was before we got married. We decided that divorce did not exist, that we were both Christians coming into this as a covenant relationship. And this was it. Right. right. So I feel like, and that's the number one thing that I share with people, especially if it's younger people who are not married yet, that right there for me, set up that healthy boundary that when, and I think for me personally, I knew the issues I had, but no one else had seen them because I could always get away, but we got married. He was there all the time. <laughs> there was no hiding my issues, right? right? He was always there. So it had to be dealt with instead of stuffed, right? And right. instead of just dealt with on my own in my room by myself at my apartment at night when everybody else is not around. And so that's kind of what happened with us. But when we hit that hard spot, literally our first bump was on the plane ride home from our honeymoon. <laughs> it was like, oh gosh. And when we hit that time though, because we had made that decision that divorce does not exist, I had the freedom and the security to deal with the tough stuff that I think if you do not have that understanding, now we'll talk about divorce a little bit more later. I know there are other extenuating circumstances, but when we're talking to believers coming into a covenant relationship, because we knew that we had set that up, we could deal with that stuff that I didn't have to fear. Is he going to leave me? You know, I don't have to keep faking it or keep stuffing it or keep just dealing with it somewhere else or, and it always causing issues. We could go in there, do the hard work and get to the bottom of these things and get some real healing. I, I actually wrote a blog post at the beginning, um, several years ago. And I said, it was kind of like Miss Insecure met Mr. Insensitive. <laughs> That's where we were at that point. You know, that's exactly where we were. But yeah. since we could deal with that, it became this beautiful thing that our marriage is so great now and so strong. And I mean, it took the first several years, you know, but man, I'm thankful for it because God uses all of it. And so I want to say one more thing, and then I just want you to keep just running with this. But at that conference, and we've been married about almost seven years, right around that and you said a phrase that is probably something you, I'm assuming you say it all the time. Maybe it just stuck out to me. I have shared it for years. You said, what if marriage was more to make you holy than to make you happy? Right. Wow. Wow. That well, has I, never left me. I, I think that's what it does. Um, now that statement, it's the subtitle of sacred marriage and it's been okay. debated and challenged and, and, and taken on, but <laughs> What I explain is that John Wesley, the famous evangelist, had a great line where he said, I don't know anybody who's truly happy who isn't also pursuing holy. Ooh. So I'm not suggesting that happiness and holiness go to war against each other. I actually think holiness is the portal to happiness. If you have a guy whose anger isn't under control, he's not happy. You can't be happy if your relationships are a mess. If you have a woman who's constantly critical or negative, she's not happy. Uh, if you have somebody who's addicted, there might be moments of pleasure, but it's about compulsion. It's not about freedom. It's not about happiness. And so it's not in doing that, putting holiness against happiness. It's just saying that Jesus told us yes. the most successful life, the most fulfilling life, Matthew 6, 33, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Yes. I just wrote that down while you were talking. Keep going. Yes. So if, if Jesus says, I want you to seek first, not a happy marriage, not successful mm -hmm. kids, not mm -hmm. wealth, not affluence, not early retirement. He said, seek first my kingdom, his yeah. work, his rule, his reign, and his righteousness. Mm -hmm. and, and here's what I found, Jenny. When I die to the things that destroy most marriages, and Paul would listen Colossians 3, 8, anger, rage, malice, yeah. slander, filthy language, and lying. Elsewhere, he would talk about problems like lust and refer to addictions and whatnot. I'm, I'm destroying, I'm, I'm dying to most of the things that push a wife away. And then when I rise up to the things, because righteousness isn't just about taking off the bad, it's about putting on the good. And Paul does that in Colossians 3, 12, where he says, we put on 
compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, and love. So if you have a man or woman who see themselves as brother and sister in Christ, as much as husband and wife on earth, mm -hmm. um, and they're, they're taking off the things that really destroy most relationships and then putting on the things, look, don't you want to live around somebody who's humble and compassionate and mm -hmm. kind and gentle and patient? Jesus isn't referring to marriage in Matthew 6, 33, but if people would apply it, it's going to lead to the happiest of marriages. The problem is we want happiness without dealing with our anger, without dealing with our materialism, without dealing with our negativity or all, all of those other issues. And, and we can't because those things make us miserable. If you are selfish, you're miserable. Yes. Yeah. Yes. It's all about what we're seeking, right? Yeah. It's all about what we're seeking. Because if our focus is on him, and, and it is, I mean, I wrote that down while you were talking, and then you brought it up, Matthew 6, 33. If we'll seek after his kingdom, the other things fall into place. So like you said, it's not holiness versus happiness, but it's when we pursue holiness, we're filled with the other things like happiness and joy right. and satisfaction in our marriage. Because if we're looking to our spouse to be what only Jesus can be for us, we're never satisfied. But if we're and looking to Christ for that, then satisfaction comes and we don't put that burden on them, right? Exactly. And, and a lot of that subtitle was in response to the people. I'm sure you've heard this so many times, Jenny, when somebody's sure. explaining why they've left their marriage, well, doesn't God want me to be happy? Uh. <laughs> and, and it's just, it's mm. just, it's a different way of looking at things. And by happy, they mean emotional euphoria at the time. And that's just not realistic in a fallen world. There are times that are brutal in this life that aren't just related to our marriage yeah. as your kids get older as you deal with health related issues as you deal with economy issues and vocational issues and whatnot um and and so if work is frustrating you do you just divorce work? well i'm done working for the rest of my life if if parenting makes you not happy because you have a difficult child or an addicted child you say well i'm not a parent anymore i'm going to divorce this child it's just something about marriage where we feel like well, I can change that. I can get out of this. I don't have to follow yeah. through on the commitment I made. Yeah. And what I've seen more often than not, of course, I'm not talking about issues of addiction, abuse, affairs, unfaithfulness, but more often than not, uh, we cement ourselves in our spiritual immaturity when we run from what helps us grow spiritually. Otherwise, he, he, here's an analogy I've used before. If, if we run from that, we're like the people who go to the gym and drive circles around the parking lot <laughs> looking for a close place to park <laughs> before we go into exercise, right? Yeah. And they, have you lost sight of what you've come here? But just because <laughs> mentally, don't we just think that what's the easiest way out? Even though we're literally going there to exercise, we forget. And so then you go in and maybe you're paying $75 a month to get on a machine <laughs> that will make you tired and sore yeah. and hurt and smelly. Mm -hmm. And all of those things, and you're saying, why are you doing it? And you talk to the people, well, I think I can be fitter, faster, healthier. I think I can have more energy. I think I could be a better person mm -hmm. if I let myself hurt for this amount of time. Well, then you look at Christians in a marriage. Why are you willing to forgive? Why are you responding with humility and patience and kindness? Because I think I could become more like Christ. I think I can be uh, less lustful, less, less am personally ambitious, less, less self-centered. I, I want to be a different person. And marriage is the gym where I see where I'm weak and where I can become strong. And it's just a whole different view of marriage, not to exclude happiness, but to put happiness in its proper place. Yes. Oh, I love that. I love that. It is. Oh man, that's good. That's so good. There's a reason you've been so successful at what you do. <laughs> that is good. So, uh, you know, what, one thing I've always said is I think for the most part, premarital counseling is kind of a joke. You're not gonna be able to tell people much. I think we ought to, ought to offer postmarital counseling. <laughs> How many times do we get into marriage and it's not what we think it should have yeah. been? <laughs> Right. I thought I was so ready. It was shocking how bad I was. The postmarital would have been really helpful <laughs> right about, you know, the second months like, oh, so how's it going? Oh, man. Well, I'm I'm a huge fan of 
both and to be honest my wife sure. and i do a lot of premarital counseling together because we found some issues where yeah couples when especially if they're infatuated jenny and they don't even realize it i'll never forget a couple now they were already married and he said gary i feel like god has called me overseas to be a missionary he named a particular country and my wife just doesn't want to go hmm. and i looked at how long have you been married nine months Oh, wow. And you didn't talk about this beforehand. He said, well, we thought we had, wow. and, and that's what infatuated couples do. Yeah, yeah. we kind of, we'll figure it. It'll all be okay. Cause we love each other. We just want to be together. We're happy. And, yeah. and I had to tell him, you know what? Your wife wins. Yeah. <laughs> I, it, nobody can drag a spouse overseas if they don't want to go. I go, that's foolish. And when mm -hmm. you chose to marry her, you sort of put some limitations on, on what you can do. Um, yeah. And then you know, another couple I had real life situation, he's from a different country. And in that country, the parents retire, they move by their sons and the sons support them for the rest of their life. That's their pension. Mm -hmm. She'd never heard of that. And his parents were two years away from retiring. Oh, so I look at her. Did you know that? She's no. Hey, mm -hmm. have, are you willing to do? Cause that's going to influence your own savings, your own. And, and he just, well, that's what people do. Uh, and, and so it's, it's fun, particularly being in Houston. What makes Houston fun is so many different cultures and so many different weddings of people from, from different cultures. There was one where she was from a country where it would be an insult to ask the bride's family to pay for the wedding. Hmm. Yeah, they're in the United States, but there is no, I mean, for them, it would just be an insult. I mean, the bride would pay for her dress. Mm -hmm. but the groom pays for the wedding because he's getting a good deal and so mm -hmm. <laughs> there are these things where you, you just you just bring it out and so we really get into it with premarital because i've just found um there are a lot of questions that couples aren't asking yeah no those, uh, those are good those are very good points i i think my husband and i both being so type a helped us to <laughs> ask all the hard questions and talk to you literally about everything from retirement to everything else before we got married. But you're right. You're absolutely right. And, and I don't really this premarital counseling, but I do feel like so many times it's easy to like you said, yeah, it's all going to be good <laughs> no yeah. matter what. And then you get a couple months down the road and you're like, whoa, not what I expected. So I think yes, both yes. And for sure. Um, so let me ask you this. Whoops. I just dropped my pen. The whole issue of divorce is such a sticky area, and especially in the, in the church. We don't want to give a green light to, oh, yeah, whatever, you're not happy, okay, it just wasn't meant to be, you know, those types of things, because we do see it as a covenant relationship. And we know the scripture says God hates divorce, and, and Christ had, you know, a lot to talk about that as well. I would love to hear from you. And I'm not trying to put you in a corner, but I know you've done some talking about this. And I know that there was quite a bit in your book, um, Loving Him Well, that was previously Sacred Influence, right? Yes. Okay. I, that was good. I actually just finished doing the audio version and I loved that. Loved that. So what do you, what do you say? Where do you come down? What do you say? This is the scriptural line because you did make um, one phrase that I thought was very powerful when you said that God prioritizes his people over his institutions. And I had never heard it said that way. And that was very powerful too. So I'd love to hear your thoughts. And I don't even know if that's a clear enough question for you to know which direction to go. <laughs> yeah. When I deal with these issues, let me just be as honest with you as I can. Please. I'll drop mm -hmm. my guard and let people allow me to give a little bit lengthier of an answer. Because I know that people just want the sound bite, tell me this or that or whatnot. But, but it goes back to when I wrote Sacred Marriage. I wrote Sacred Marriage in part because I felt like people were saying, apply these five principles of Jesus and you have the best marriage possible. Do these six mm -hmm. biblical things and every marriage is nothing but happiness and roses. And I came back and said, no. Mm -hmm. well, every marriage should have good times, but every marriage is going to have its difficult. And everybody said, wow, here's this guy admitting that marriage is difficult. And mm -hmm. so then for a decade, because Mar Sacred Marriage did really well. It sold over a million copies. And so now people come back, oh, we shouldn't talk about the difficulty of marriage. That's So they're going back to we can, and it's just funny how we just flip flop in teaching. Mm. And when I was growing up, a lot of Christians thought you weren't supposed to drink at all. Now scripture has some passages where it celebrates wine. And maybe one generation that I grew up in went too hard saying you just shouldn't avoid it. 
but I think my kids' generation, it was sort of like, there's, we're free, we can do it. I, I remember saying to my kids, I, I, I grant you that the Bible celebrates wine in some places, and I don't preach an absolute prohibition. I said, but when you've met um, a, a woman whose life was devastated because her dad was an alcoholic, when you've had to attend the funeral or officiated a funeral where an alcoholic killed a family member from someone else, when you've seen the devastation, you might not be quite so cavalier. We just go back and forth. No wine, drink too much. And I think what that's what happened with divorce. We rightly understand when Jesus says, Jesus was pushing back against too easy divorce in the first century, where men, some, some strains of rabbinic teaching were saying, men can divorce their wives just if they're displeased with them. Sure. And, and it was a time when women were so vulnerable, mm -hmm. where basically they had two options. If their extended family was alive, which is much less common than they are today, because deep, people died much sooner then, then their parents could take care of them or prostitution or begging. And Jesus said, I hate it when divorce is used as a weapon, when you marry a woman who's at her strongest and, and society might say, I'm not saying, society might say her most desirable. And then you sort of use up those years and then say, okay, you're done with her to find a new improvement. Jesus hates that. And of course, women can do that to men as well. And so the church rightly said, no, divorce is a problem. Jesus talks it out. The thing is, I, Jesus said what he said in the first century to protect women from having divorce used against them as a weapon, not to imprison them in soul-destroying or body-damaging marriages. He, he just didn't. Um, it, you, it's like the, the Beatitudes, the way we read them and everything. Jesus isn't saying you do that to be blessed. He was probably pointing at people. This person is poor. Well, actually, blessed is this poor person because theirs is the kingdom of God. Or blessed you. And, and, and he's, he's challenging the way that they would look at, at divorce. And so um, if... When I talk about, I'm really going around in circles here, no, but I told you great. I was going to do that. When you say about the institutions, God created the Sabbath and took it so seriously that people could be killed in the Old Testament for not obeying the Sabbath. And yet Jesus said very clearly, the Sabbath is made for man, yeah. not man for the Sabbath. Jesus, we're told in scripture, Romans 13, obey the government. God has put them in authority. And there are instances in scripture where we're called to disobey the government. Parents are told in Colossians to honor their parents and honor their fathers. And yet Paul comes around and says, but fathers, don't exasperate your children. So every time, and, and in Timothy, he says to Timothy, Paul does, elders are worthy of double honor. And then right after that, but if an elder sins and doesn't repent, here's how you handle the elder. So Paul sets up institutions, government, church, parenting, and marriage, and says, respect that authority, honor it, but recognizing it can be abused. And so if a man or woman is abusing the authority of marriage, um, multiple unfaithfulness, abuse, abandonment, there's a time when you don't use that institution, which God created and called good, to imprison the person. Uh, it, it just changed when I realized, and I just don't think this way, and I had to have my eyes open. But seen a situation where a guy wanted the marriage to continue, not because he wanted to have a healthy marriage, not mm -hmm. because he wanted to love this woman, but because he got a sick thrill out of terrorizing her, diminishing her, condescending to her. Mm -hmm. And I realized, you know, preserving that marriage would be preserving a platform of abuse and terrorism. And I just don't think that honors God. So yeah. these are things that have to be dealt with individually and pastorally. Of course. Um, I do think, I, I'm just saying this as a Christian man, I read this morning, Matthew 5, Jesus says, one of his commands, don't divorce your wife. I'm, I'm taking that as a Christian man, that I, I'm, I'm committed to my marriage for, for life. We're going to be married 38 years this June, but yes. I'm not married to an unfaithful woman. I'm not married to an abusive woman. Mm -hmm. So, um, but if there are seasons where Lisa and I weren't connecting, those are the seasons when Jesus says, no, you don't, you don't get a hall pass. You work it out. Mm -hmm. um, and I think every marriage will come to those seasons, not where both want to, but probably one of the partners wants to think, 
man. And, and it's God's kindness where he says, I'm taking that option off the table. Like you said with your husband. Yeah, I, that, that's not an option. We need to learn to work through this. Yeah. That's the heart of Jesus. I believe it's the heart of Paul. I believe mm -hmm. it needs to be the heart of the church. So not going too soft on divorce, which I think some people are doing now because it's been too, I, I just don't, I just wish we could stop flip-flopping. I wish we could do nuance. And yeah. today's church just doesn't do nuance. You know, it's this stark this or that. And mm -hmm. it drives mm -hmm. me crazy. I hear you. There's, there's one extreme or the other. And God's like, people, <laughs> can we meet here and discuss in love, right? Oh man, I read a book. Goodness, I want to give credit to the author. So I'll have to put it in here because I can't remember the author, but it was called Messy Grace. I don't know if you're familiar with it or not. Yeah. Amazing book, but he talked about, He's seen truth with no grace and grace with no truth. And that tension in the middle is love. And I thought that was such a powerful thing because we have to hold to the truth of the word of God. But we also have to operate in the grace and the mercy that Christ models for us. And it's a messy, tough place to be in, you know, but I think that that's where the church needs to find itself. Okay. So you talked about when one wants to work it out and one doesn't, what kind of advice do you give to that spouse who really is prepared to fight for the marriage, but the other one just doesn't want to do it? Uh, I've been working on a blog post. I didn't finish it yet, but I like the title. You can be a good person in a bad marriage. Uh, there are two strains of thought. We're, we're going to kind of get into psychology a little bit here, but, sure, but I think we have time. There's yeah. attachment theory, which yes. Sue Johnson has been a proponent of. And then there's what's called differentiation that Dr. David Schnarch, who died about 18 months ago, talked about a lot. I'm sort of a both and kind of person. I like to find bridges rather than argue one camp around. But attachment theory is what most people think of. What makes somebody feel safe and connected? How do we die to ourselves so that we become one? The most important thing is to be attached and connected. Differentiation realizes that you have to hold on to yourself because there may be times when your spouse can't or won't respond in a way that you want them to respond and you can't fall apart. You need to be strong enough for the marriage to exist. Um, differentiation is this. Um, in, in fact, my wife and I just went through this. Um, we were thinking about the short trip that we needed to take. We're planning on moving and going to the other state and just checking out some houses. My wife wanted to wrap up some things here before we go and do that. And so we're just going back and forth. It was clear. I thought, let's just go ahead and do it. She's not, man, I'm just not sure we want to. And then finally she said, I just don't think we should do it. She goes, but I don't want you to be frustrated that we're not. And this is where differentiation theory comes. I go, no, you can't ask that. You can't ask me not. Now I'm submitting to you. We're not going to go. I'm just taking that off the table. I want yeah. you to be at peace. We're not going to go. But you don't, just because you don't want me to be frustrated means, doesn't mean I, I, I can't be frustrated and Lisa <laughs> has to be strong enough to know I will sometimes be frustrated with her and I have to be gracious enough to know I can be frustrated with her but I'm not going to control her I'm not going to dominate that's what differentiation is sure. that you agree that you're still two individuals you own your own emotions you own your own response you treat each other with gentleness patience compassion humility which I think we both did there but you have to accept you know Nobody marries a fourth member of the Trinity. <laughs> and even then, there are times when we're angry with God. There are times when we're yeah. frustrated with God. We wish God wouldn't do what he does, even though, of course, he always does the right thing. Um, and, and so I think when you have that situation, like people say, what if sacred marriage doesn't work? I said, well, you're looking at it, I think, through the long lens. It's not about what works. It's about are you being humble? And are you being courageous? See, some people might think I'm, I shouldn't ever rock the boat. I should just grip my teeth. No, that's not always holy. Jesus confronted people. Jesus overturned the temple, the tables at the temple. So, but I can't guarantee my spouse will respond in any particular way. Yeah. So do what you know to be right. Do what most pleases your heavenly father. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness yeah. and then leave the results to you know, to God and to what yeah. your spouse does. We can't determine how our spouse responds. We can determine how we act. And that's what we're held accountable to. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's our act of, of worship to the Lord, right? It's our focus is doing what he would have us to do for him. 
and not doing it because the other person deserves it or because we're expecting them to reciprocate in a certain way. We just have to, we answer to him for how we live our life and whether we live our marriage in a way that's honoring to him and the way he's asked us to, regardless of, it's almost not about the other person, <laughs> you know, even though we need to love on them and, and be there for them and be their helper and be what God has placed us to be in their life. Ultimately, it's living out our life and our day and our marriage in a way that is walking the path that he's laid out for us and honoring him in all we do. Mm, so good. So you, in your book, Loving Him Well, there was a line and you talked about this. How does a wife love an emotionally distant man? Because my man is not like that now. He was a little bit more like that when we first got married. Now he's, he's a rock star. He's an awesome guy. But I know a lot of women in this situation where the man, he doesn't feel or he doesn't want to feel, you know? And yeah. how does she, and obviously majority of females are created with so many feelings. How does she show love and love a man who's just emotionally distant? First, I want to say, and, and that question could have a couple of different answers. Let me take one angle in particular, since I'm a guy <laughs> talking to women. What I really want to stress that wives realize is that they married a man for a reason. And you admitted that men are different than women. Amen. And when you get into emotionally distant, I want to ask them, what do you mean by that? For instance, it's been shown neurologically that when a woman shares her feelings, it's like a release valve. It, it, it makes her feel better and comforted. When a male shares hurtful experiences in the day when he relives a painful day it actually hurts him mm. and, and and so women don't get that why does he want to share his bad day why do you hear this all the time men who have like world war ii veterans or vietnam how come they never talked about those war things why would they never go there mm. and, and women ask because they think it'd be so comforting you could get help and the guys because it reliving it to the male brain may, is painful it's not healing. And I don't know why those are different. I think we just have different calls in life. And another thing that's, that's very different is the way we respond to things. Um, the woman expresses empathy. Now, there are bridge brains, okay? There, men can be one sure. way extreme. Women can be one way extreme. And you can sure. have a man or woman that can be very close. I'm talking stereotypes. Yeah. This isn't true of every man. It's not true of every woman. But uh, I, I'm quoting here Dr. Laura Brizendine who was educated at Yale and Harvard and is a practicing neuroscientist. So I'm, I'm way out of my league, but I'm quoting somebody who isn't, right? Who <laughs> gotcha. and, and she talks about how women tend toward what's called the MNS, the mirror neuron system, which means if a woman is hurting, the woman's way of showing empathy is, oh, well, tell me, yes. She looks in her eyes. Yes, she's expressed, she's mirroring her hurt. Mm -hmm. And that's how she expresses empathy. The man tends toward what's called TPJ, the temporal parietal junction. And that means he wants to fix it. Okay, immediately most wives get this. Yes, I don't want my <laughs> husband to have to fix it. Yeah. But the thing is, that's how he expresses empathy because he says something is hurting my woman. I want to make it stop or I'm angry that it's happening. I'm going to get up and I'm going to do something. Now, Here's what I, I'm not asking women to become like men or men to become like women. I'm asking women to respect men and men to respect women. I've told yeah. guys so many times in mixed groups and men alone, women don't feel loved if we don't mirror their empathy. All right. That's not where our brains naturally go, but we can learn to do that. I'm sorry, honey. Tell me, oh, that must've been tough. Here's what I found. If I mirror that with my wife, which is a learned skill, I can do that. I don't just have to do what my brain wants me to do. I can come back three hours. You know, I was thinking about this. I was praying about this. What if we do that? Now my wife is willing to have me help try to fix it because we connected. She wants to connect. I feel you. I'm with you. But now can we do something about it? But I want to explain to wives to plead their husband's cause. When he's trying to fix it, even though it drives you crazy, neuroscientifically, it's an act of empathy. It's how God designed him that when he sees you hurting, he wants to stop the hurting. 
Now, I'm just being an amateur uh, biologist here. <laughs> Isn't it helpful for a family if one person experiences empathy by mirroring and another person experiences empathy by trying to fix it? Amen. Aren't children blessed because there are two different approaches? They can yeah. get the nurture and they can get the protection. So yes. instead of fighting this or denying it, as some people do, I just want wives to understand their husbands. What do you mean? If he's always trying to fix it, look, he can learn not to do that. And he should learn. He should learn to mirror empathy. But wives, understand it's not his natural response. He's going to have to learn how to do that. So don't give him his due. Maybe yeah. he really is empathetic. It hurts him to see you in pain and not try to do something about it. Yeah. That's where his it. brain jumps. I love so just that. understand him. Yeah, I, I love I love how you're pulling that together because you're right. It's it's not always what they're doing, but the motivation behind it. And that's sometimes what we need to really see. And that was a thing for Tim and I for a long time. And I do, I just have to give kudos to him. One thing he has over the last, I don't know, probably 10 years or so that he started doing is when I start to share something, he he will stop me from the very beginning and go, do you want me to listen or do you want an answer? You know, do you want me to, li do you want me to listen or do you want me to fix Good it? Good for him. Oh, it's yes. amazing. And we just yes. kind of figured that out. That's a communication thing we need. So I can say, I just want you to listen because I think for women, and of course I'm speaking for myself here, but I guess I'm one of them. I think that one of the things that happens is the minute he starts to try to fix my problem, two things. One, I feel dismissed because I feel like he stopped listening to me and yeah. just started jumping to fixing. And two, I feel like he's trying to control me. Yeah. I, and, and that I'm sure I have no doubt. I have a wonderful counselor that has a lot to do with my own issues. <laughs> I know that's, I'm sure that's a lot deeper than just a marriage for the average person, but there's a sense that kind of rises up in me. And I think I'm a very passionate, strong personality. So when he starts to fix it, I almost feel controlled or like con confined. And it frustrates me. So I don't know if that plays into that, if that's normal for most women or if that's just me, but those are two things that come to my mind. But when you can stop one, when you can just learn and when women in general can learn that their husbands are wired a certain way, but it's kind of like Gary Chapman talks about, you know, with love languages, there were things that they do that maybe you're going, you know, my husband used to spend every day, every Saturday in the yard spraying roundup, weeding things, doing stuff I didn't even know needed to be doing. And we were in Northern Virginia. I mean, our yard was like a quarter of an acre. I don't know what he was doing out there. And to him, he was showing love through acts of service because that's yeah. his primary language where to me, I was like, just come in here and sit down with us, you know, and be in the family. Um, what are you doing all the time? So it's just sometimes being able to see not just what they're doing, but why they're doing it. I think that's so helpful. But I also found, and this again, may just be us, when he does try to mirror and it's, <laughs> it's, I just would say a word to wives. If you want them to do something and they try to do it, but they don't do it the way you want them to do it, cut them a little slack yes. <laughs> because, <laughs> because like he'll try. So he'll put his hands on his face and people I'm just using audio. So they're not going to see me, but he'll put his hands on both sides of his cheek and he'll look right at me. He'll go, Hmm, huh? And I'm like, Oh my gosh, stop patronizing me. <laughs> This is this is so classic, but oh, here's and this it's it's why I think that chapter in loving him well. I've gotten a lot of responses understanding the male mind because I'm just trying yeah. to help wives understand just to look at it differently. Yeah. But it's it's classic where um, men do that, and but there are so many things where if women could just understand the way that men and again, not every man is the same, not every woman is the same. But it's a jumping off place if you get some understanding to try to understand your husband. There's a reason that 85% of stonewallers are men. Hmm. It's far more likely to be a male thing than a female thing because men's brains are more likely to get flooded. It doesn't excuse stonewalling. Stonewalling is death to a relationship. Men need to repent of stonewalling. But there's a reason the vast majority of the people who do that tend to be men. So um, if, if you want your man to grow, this is so key. If men feel like we can't win, we stop playing the game.
Yes. I saw this before Sacred Marriage came out. I had to do a lot of collaborative books to help feed my family. And I got to know some famous people. Yeah. And I found something like famous athletes sometimes. Their, their identity is being a great athlete. It's why some will never take up golf. <laughs> because they don't want to be bad at anything. Mm -hmm. And golf is so difficult. We just won't play. And so if you want your husband to pray with you and the kids, but you ridicule his prayer. Yes eventually he's just not going to pray because I can't, I can't win. I'm, I'm not going to do that. If yes. you want him to spend more time at home, but you keep berating him at how awful he is at home, he's not going to want to go home because you know what? At work, they might say, man, you're doing such a good job. You're up for a promotion on the mm -hmm. golf course. Man, that was a perfect drive right down the free fairway. Mm -hmm. uh, you got the biggest buck. Well, you know how to shoot that gun, whatever it is, mm -hmm. guys, I'm not saying we should. Jenny, this is just helping women deal with real situations. Yeah. We tend to play games we think we can win. So the best thing you can do to encourage your husband is give him a win. If yeah. he prays for you, hey, babe, thanks for praying for me. I heard an account one time where a guy did that. And so I said, okay, how about a real prayer this time? <sighs> I, I, just, I, I get it. She was disappointed in the prayer. <laughs> But you don't have to say it just because you're thinking it. Oh, um, it, it it's, it's about helping your spouse grow and understand them. And I have found a lot of things. Again, you can overdo this. But a lot of marital issues are issues between a man and a woman, not just between two individuals. Mm -hmm. And, and if, if men understood women's brains a little bit better, men understood women's brains, uh, I, I think we would have happier marriages because we are different. And understanding that is a way to help my wife feel cherished. I naturally want to fix it, but I know she needs me to show empathy. So I've learned, Gary, empathy first, wait, pause, 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 then offer to fix if she wants you to. Yeah. But that had to be learned. That didn't come natural to me. Yeah. Mm, that's good. That's so good. And I do, I want, <laughs> so I want to switch gears just a little bit because before we go so far down the trail that anyone thinks that it's all the men have all the problems and the women are fine. <laughs> we, we never want to go down that flat path because goodness knows that's not true. Um, I do, there was one thing you brought up and I, I keep going back to loving him well, cause that's the one I just read, even though sacred marriage is incredible. And it was probably what started me on such a wonderful positive trajectory in mine and Tim's relationship and looking at marriage through a much healthier perspective, I believe. So I, I am very thankful for that. Uh, but I believe it was in loving him well. And you talked about <laughs> like, talked about the trap of women falling into pride if they find themselves to be more spiritually mature. Do you know where I'm getting at there? Yes. Yeah. 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 Because that's, that is legit. That really is. And can you talk about that a little bit? Because yeah. we have to watch that. Yeah. If we're Christians first, Jenny, and I hope mm -hmm. all of us are, the Bible could not be clear on this. The strong gives way to the weak. Mm -hmm. If you really are a more mature believer, if you really are wiser, if you really are godlier, Paul would say, okay, you set the example. Peter says the same thing. Wives, if you're married to a non-believer, let your example win him over. Yeah. Instead of belittling them for being less mature, less wise, less godly, you set an example and you give way for them. That's just God's way of operating. And so um, being prideful about this, um, the Christian classics say pride is the worst sin. There are three times in scripture. Scripture doesn't usually repeat itself. Yeah. There are three times in scripture when it said God opposes the proud, mm -hmm. but gives grace to the humble. Yeah. And yet we don't see pride as the great spiritual threat that scripture does, as the Christian classics call it. And so a wife doesn't realize when she's being proud, she may be frustrating God more than her husband who's, yeah. you know, whatever it's he's. It's a Pharisee. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Because who are we to, to look down on someone else's relationship? We can just folks stay in our own lane, as I like to say, you know, like Hebrews 12, 1 looking away from everything that would distract marking, you know, run the course marked out for you. And so many times it can be a trap. It can most definitely be a trap. But I also, I guess one thought that I've been sharing lately with some of the women I've been doing Bible studies with is I felt like I would go to the Lord, you know, especially in the early years and complain more than pray probably about 
Tim not doing this or not doing that or the way he did this and blah, 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 blah. And I kind of felt God tell me, you know what? I would love to tell him about that, but you won't stop lo talking long enough for him to hear me. You know? <laughs> and it was like, oh, or, you know, I heard someone one time say, you cannot be your husband's Holy Spirit, but we try, you know, we try so hard and it just pushes you in the other direction, right? Like you were saying, give him a win. And it's, it's so tempting to feel like, oh, I've you know been walking with the Lord deeper or longer or pursuing my faith and he's not. And we look, we go back to that personality thing. And my husband and I are a classic example of just such a different approach or visual look appearance to our walks with the Lord, you know, and worship my hands are up and I, you know, and I love to speak and teach and I'm passionate and I'm fiery and he will stand there. And I've seen him raise his hand three times in the 16 years, 17 years we've been together, you know, <laughs> and I'm like, oh my gosh, like what's going on? Why isn't there something going on here? How can you hold still? Why don't you look like you're getting stuff? And yet I know I see the fruits and I know that his prayer life is probably so much more solid and grounded than mine. And I see other ways that his depth of walk with the Lord manifests itself. And so just because we look differently on the outside to the casual observer really doesn't say anything about the internal status of our heart and our spirit before the Lord. Yeah. Well, there, there are two things. If, if a wife wants to really influence her husband, two things that I've found is that uh, because I said we stop playing the game if we feel like we can't win. And again, I'm not excusing men for doing this. I'm just, I'm trying to give real world actual advice. That's where I think there, there are two chapters. How do you learn to be thankful for an imperfect man? Mm -hmm. um, it, it, the platform has to be, how do I become thankful for him? If your standard is perfection, um, you're going to lose the ability to influence him because he's going to start to feel like he can't win. Because I, I, I've seen it, Jen. I've seen women who husbands, whose husbands take them to church. They've provided so well. The wife, yeah, a lot of wives want to work. If the wife doesn't want to work. They don't have to. The husband is involved. And yet the wife just takes that as a base. Well, all men are supposed to be like that. When another woman just wishes her husband would get a job so she didn't have to work too. So yeah. it, it's easy. It doesn't seem to me to be a direct correlation between how wonderful a man is and how grateful his wife is for him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I've seen women really grateful mm -hmm. for guys that I think, man, you're, you're, <laughs> and yet guys that are just incredible and wives just take them for granted. So I think gratitude and thankfulness is a seedbed for influence. The other thing that a lot of women don't understand is respect. Um, yes. And I'm not talking about the wife respecting the husband. I'm talking about the husband respecting the wife because guys are influenced by people we respect. And so if you're growing mm -hmm. in the Lord and your husband admires your faith, if you're really good with relationships and you're helping him, if he's weak, if you're helping him, if you have a skill in a certain area, I, I hear guys brag about their wives all the time great real estate agent or they're this or that or whatnot um it, it just go on a golf course if a guy that can't break a hundred in a round of golf tells me how to do better on my drives i'm not listening to him <laughs> if if rory mcelroy one of the world's best golfers comes up and says, hey gary hold the i'm listening to him because i respect him so yeah. b I, I think too much has often been made about wise respecting husband i think it's a good thing to do for wise respect their husbands but i found for influence, it's really important that the wife say, how do I become someone my husband will really respect? I think respect is so crucial both ways. Mm. I'm not discounting that husband respecting their wives, hus wives respecting their husbands, but it's also the seedbed for a wife to influence her husband to make sure that he respects her. And part mm. of that might be, Jenny, not letting him walk over you. Stand up yeah. and say, no, I'm not going to, I'm not going to accept that kind of treatment. Yeah. Um, and wives often are worried. Well, what if I do that? If he's not going to, I go, no, if he respects you more, your relationship is going to get better. Yeah. It might frustrate him. He may not be getting his way, but respect is so important to influence. Don't give up on respect thinking that that's going to make him more closer, closer to you. Because if he's letting disrespect grow, that relationship is headed in the wrong direction fast. Mm, that is so good. That is so good. That's something to sit with for a while, for sure. Mm, I love it. Okay. Well, my last two questions, and I feel like you really said a lot of that. Um, I had on here one, you know, what's your 
top tips, top advice for making a good marriage into a great marriage. And then the other one would be speaking to wives. What's the number one thing we can do to ensure that our husbands feel loved, wanted, needed, and respected. Okay. So you can just tie all that up however you want, but you have hit on a lot of that already for yeah. sure. Let, let's do with making a good marriage into a great marriage. Uh, that, probably four things I'm going to say real quick. I'll try to make quick. I've already said Matthew 633. Seek first the King God and his righteousness. You make a marriage better when you have a purpose greater than yourself. Selfishness mm -hmm. destroys a relationship because we're made for more than marriage. Find that purpose. Why did God create you? And how can you and your husband together serve God? When you have a reason to live outside of your marriage, it gives life to your marriage. Mm -hmm. Don't worry about falling out of love. Worry about falling out of purpose. Mm -hmm. And then seek to grow. Don't worry about falling out of love. Worry about falling out of repentance. It's the lack of character that brings so many marriages down. So Spiritual purpose is the first one. The second one, learn the power of cherishing. Uh, for me, I, I wrote a book called Cherish, the one word that changes everything for your marriage. And, and Lisa and I have been married probably 30 years when I was working on that book. We already had what I thought was a good marriage, many times even a great marriage, but it was like raising the bar. Mm -hmm. Love focuses on sacrifice, service, commitment, persevering, hanging in there. But cherish is like the jam. So that marriage isn't like a duty and a discipline. It's what makes it a delight. And I became nice. convinced, and I am convinced today, that with a different mindset and different attitudes and certain habits, you can choose to cherish your spouse. And the response has been phenomenal. People saying it took our marriage. To, it's just what we needed. It's just like raising the bar. That's How nice. do I want to have a different marriage? Well, I want to introduce the element of cherishing. Two more things I've seen help happen because if you put these two together, divorce virtually never happens. Um, and I, I'm almost hesitant to say this now. I'm talking to a lot of wives because most wives want this and husbands tend to be the block. But just praying together a few times a week. Um, I've seen studies that show if a couple will pray together three or four times a week and have sex twice a week, they don't get divorced. I mean, statistically, it just doesn't happen. They just don't get divorced. Now, I don't know if it's the prayer and the sex that keeps the divorce away or having a certain kind of marriage so that you can have sex and pray makes it so you don't get divorced. It can go I, I don't both know. Ways. Yeah, maybe both. It can both. do both. Yeah. But um, it, it's certainly helpful. And so I think um, seek to build spiritual intimacy, but then also seek to develop sexual intimacy. I know I'm talking to a lot of wives. Mm -hmm. And if you said, you could take this the wrong way. I'm stepping out on a limb saying that. Go for it. But I talk to a lot of men. There's a lot of men's retreats. I talk to a lot of couples. If a wife would say, assuming this is a healthy marriage, assuming that they both want to pursue mutual sexual pleasure, there are a lot of things that can make it. To, she just says, I want my husband to be uh, sexually fulfilled. And part of that might be, so he needs to learn how to be a better lover so that I'm fulfilled. I can't really, I can't fake it for me to sure. get into it. I need to have the hard conversations about what isn't working in our own relationship. So yeah. I'm not putting it all on just the wife serving her husband or just meeting his needs or working for the best sexual relationship is mutual, but recognizing for a lot of guys, if that's happening and they're praying, they've got spiritual purpose, they're growing in righteousness and they're pursuing cherish. You've, you've got an all-star marriage there. It's going to be okay. firing. You're still in a fallen world. You're still two sinners trying to work it out. So there'll be difficulties and moments of frustration. But those are the elements that God gives us to help grow a marriage. Uh, so and I, I think they do wonders if we'll just put a little more effort. And some are thinking, you know what, we've let the spiritual element wane. Some says, you know what, we really don't have an outside purpose. We're kind of living selfish lives. Some might say, you know what, we, we do okay sexually. We just haven't made it a priority. Mm -hmm. So figure out what might be most lacking with your husband. Maybe ask your husband what's most lacking, and then say, what are the resources we can find to yeah. help grow in that area? That's so good. That's so good. And we can't wait to feel like it on any, on any of those. You know, we sometimes you just have to make a commitment and go for it and the feelings will follow. They will be the fruit Absolutely. of those connections because, and I do, I see it like a cycle. It's like you have sex, so you're more likely to pray together. You pray together, you're more likely to have sex. I mean, you know, it's like a circle exactly. because there's an intimacy. I, I have told many friends and- People think I'm crazy, but I think in a lot of ways, sex is the restart button of a marriage. Like you too many days too long and you just don't have the connection. 
you're just kind of start to passing like people passing. You're talking about what you got to do with the kids, what's got to be done here. And, you did, and you're just not really connected. And then it's sometimes it's not because you are really in the mood, but it's because we need to do this right now. And then afterwards, it's like, oh, wow, now we're connected again on a whole nother level, much more likely to pray and be vulnerable and be connected with you. Cause I have that feel that passion, that compassion and, and the other way around, you know? So I feel like what you're saying are incredible tools that sometimes we just have to use those tools, whether we feel like it or not, knowing that those feelings will often come as a result of those tools, right? Absolutely. Oh, that's so good. Oh, you know what? And there's one thing because you brought something up and I almost forgot. So the question I put out a little post on uh, Facebook and Instagram, and I got this one question and it goes along with this quite a bit. So I wanted to ask you your thoughts on it. It gives me a lot of thoughts, but <laughs> here's the thought, or here's the question. It says, what do you think about married couples who don't bed share? What is the impact on intimacy and the relationship in general? So I, again, I don't like to give wide advice to very particular situations. Of course. I know how crucial sleep is to mental, spiritual, and physical health. It's essential. Yeah. So if your husband is snoring um, and it's keeping a woman awake, if you think about it, what about the times before you can cuddle? And then they can come in in the morning. You can have that time together. But if it's really an impacting a person's health, I, there's no law that says you have to sleep together because you're kind of unconscious throughout the night. And so I, I really would say, why aren't you sleeping together? And then try to find the best elements of sleeping together. Can you spend some time in the bed and then one gets up and moves elsewhere? If it's really for matters of physical health and mental health, I think it's so crucial that you shouldn't feel guilty about yeah. it. It's okay. Um, on the other hand, if it's a picture of estrangement, then I'm going to address that. It, 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 it's the same thing, Jane, when we just talked about sex. I want to know why a couple isn't having sex, mm -hmm. right? I if there's the question, grief, right? if there's yeah. emotional travail, well, of course you're not. It's not about, it's, it's understand. And I'd say the same thing. Well, why aren't you sleeping in the same bed? There could be some good reasons. Um, mm -hmm. And, and so you shouldn't feel guilty if there are, then just try to get the best benefits of being together where you can just lay and hold each other, maybe pray and then go into the next room and then maybe slip in early in the morning. And so you have that time that most couples have. The reality is, Jenny, my wife and I don't have the same sleep schedules. We mm -hmm. almost always sleep in the same bed. Yeah. Sometimes hotels will give us twin, you know, the two beds for some reason, whatever, so we can't. <laughs> But 99% but of the time. But here's the thing. I go to bed often an hour before her, and I usually wake up a few hours before her. She mm -hmm. needs more sleep than I do. Mm -hmm. So there can be times when I go to sleep before she's in the bed, and I'm out of the bed before she's awake. Yeah. So you don't so whether we're doing. sleeping in the same <laughs> bed or not, you know, yeah. we don't even really know. So yeah. if there's a legitimate reason, please don't feel guilty. Take care of your health. You're a better mom. You're a better friend. You're a better servant. You're a better wife. If mm -hmm. you're getting a good night of sleep, you don't have to measure up to any other couple. But if it's a sign that there's estrangement, then you want to talk about it. Because mm -hmm. I, I think it's a wonderful thing to begin and end the day with the one you love. Yeah, that's beautiful. I love how you went there. I love the grace in that answer because there can be shame attached with you know, sharing things that seem not normal, but obviously what you're saying, you're so right about the impact of good quality sleep. So if there's a reason that's not happening, but the real crux of the relationship is not whether or not you're together when you're unconscious asleep, but when you are awake, are you connecting in other physical ways, yeah. whether or not you sleep together, right? Absolutely. It's not the sleep that we're actually concerned about that builds the relationship. So that's so good. I um, had, so um, do what you can. I had a wonderful testimony from a woman. She's a higher drive than her husband. And that does exist. It's not mm -hmm, that uncommon mm -hmm, anymore. Mm -hmm. And there's some nights he's just not up for full sexual intimacy. And so some nights she said, can you just hold me while we're both naked? And, and there is oxytocin that's released in our brains. Yes. It's this bonding chemical. He's, it's not as much as when you actually have sex, but she's willing to say, well, let's do what we can. And I think so often in marriage, just because you can't do 100%, do what you can. I just finished up a book that's coming out in October, and the husband was a weightlifter. 
before he got married. He used to bench press 400 pounds, wow. which is like 350 pounds more than I probably, <laughs> I mean, it's a lot of weight, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's a hyperbole, but, um, <laughs> and then he got MS like two or three years after they were married and he mm. fought it and he walked with a cane and then he had a walker and he's been in a chair for a few years now. And so at nighttime, he wheels up to the bed and he can get himself in the bed, but his wife has to move his legs over. Mm. And in his discouragement, part of him wants to say, why don't I just have her do everything? He says, but you know what, Gary, I can probably only do 20% physically of what I used to be able to do, but I'm committed to doing 100% of that 20%. Mm. And I thought that's so brilliant. That's good. If you can't have complete sex, do 100% of the 20% that you can have. I've talked to a couple... The husband had his prostate removed because of cancer uh, um, and prostate removed because of cancer, whatnot, or uh, you're both working two jobs. So you can only maybe be in the same bed for an hour. Don't make the fact that you can't do a hundred percent the enemy do what you can to have the healthiest marriage possible. If you can't pray in 10 minute slots, pray in one minute slots. Yeah. Uh, just do what you can. I, I just love that analogy. I want to do 100% of the 20% I'm capable of doing. That's so good. Oh, that's so good. That can be applied to so many things. I love that. Mm. Wow. I don't even know where to go. I don't even want to end this. This is, <laughs> this is good. This is really good. Any other thoughts on this or any of these things that we've touched on before we start to wrap things up? Yeah. Um, yeah. Let me... Let me, um, let me try this and you can see if it works. You don't have to use sure. it if it doesn't work. Sure. Um, in, in my cherished seminars, I tell the story of one time where I got the flu when I was on a speaking trip and I don't usually get sick very often. Just by God's grace, it doesn't happen, but I barely got through the night. And when you're a speaker, it's not like you're in a band. I'm the only person there I had to get through. <laughs> but then, you know how, when the, flu is breaking and the fever turns into the chill so mm -hmm. I'm in the bed at night and I'm starting to shiver and my wife started to put her arms around me and I'm telling her honey be careful this is terrible mm -hmm. you don't want to get this and she said well aren't you cold and I said yeah and she pulls me tighter and says I gotta get you warm mm -hmm. and I'll tell men do you have any idea what a woman will do for a man that cherishes her Mm -hmm. it's such a unique experience in a world where women feel invisible, where they're often taken for granted, where they're not thanked, where they're past the date, where people will even notice them or whatnot. But there's this man that will cherish them. And my experience is she'll do whatever she has to do for his benefit. But here's what I want wise to know. Do you have any idea what a man will do for a woman who cherishes him mm -hmm. in a competitive world where he's often passed over because there's a younger, newer model of a guy that can do better at work, or he's not as competitive, or he doesn't measure up, or he's at a certain age in life when he realizes he's not going to achieve his dreams. And to his kids, he's a joke more than somebody that's respected and whatnot. But he comes home and his wife cherishes him. My experience is he'll do whatever he has to do for her welfare, just because it's such a unique experience to do that. Yeah. And I just want wives to know the power and the influence they can have over their husbands. Um, it's such a unique experience. Men want it. And often women, you're just better relationally than we are. Not always, but many times you just are. But if you'll bring us along and help build this up and you deal with the areas that we talked about earlier, you're going to find a guy that more likely than not will die for you. Even more importantly, he'll live for you. He'll do the sacrifices for you. He'll do what he do. He'll do what he has to do. I, I've seen it. I've seen the, um, the gratitude in men's eyes when they talk about their wives. And the frustrating thing is they often never talk to their wives like they're talking to me about their wives because yes. they don't know how to. But wives, it doesn't mean they're not. They notice. Even more important, your heavenly father notices. And I just think there's a special reward when we make loving well a primary aim. Uh, mm -hmm. Even if your husband never thanks you, your heavenly father will. And I believe there are heavenly rewards. I, I believe there are heavenly rewards in store for those mm -hmm. who embrace a life of love. Mm -hmm. So good. Thank you so much. Thank you for doing this. Thank you for sharing and being so vulnerable and open and real with us. I really appreciate it. 
Um, gosh, I hate to even end it, but we're gonna have to end it at some point. <laughs> so one way that I always wrap up interviews is I always ask the guest, do you have a life verse or a verse that is especially bringing you life right now? Well, this is going to sound so repetitive, but I think it's Matthew 633. <laughs> hey, uh, my wife will roll her eyes. One time I got done, she told me, Gary, it's possible to preach a sermon without quoting Matthew 633. She said, I know, but it's difficult <laughs> it for too. me because <laughs> I've lived such a selfish life and, and I live such a frustrated life that others, and I said, Gary, your own righteousness, your purpose, those two things keep me on track. And I'm so prone to go off track that I just love yeah. that passage. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm, so good. All right. And I feel like the whole interview has been this, but what's one simple or practical tip that you could share with listeners about how to intertwine their everyday lives and their walks with the Lord, whether it's in parenting. I know you do so much about parenting. Actually, right here behind me, I have sacred parenting on my shelf right, yeah. right there. <laughs> I know you've got plenty of great stuff there, but what about just getting the word into our everyday lives? Do you have a practical tip for that? Yeah, well, I think Proverbs 4, 8, whatever is good, whatever is excellent, whatever is praiseworthy, you think about such things, apply that to your marriage. I did it one year by every day. I wrote down something I could thank my wife for. I was literally training my brain. It became mm. one of her Christmas presents. Mm. With I wanted to have 365 entries where I'm celebrating what she's done for me or who she is. And it was literally training my brain to find the best in my wife. Uh, and it was a wonderful experience for our marriage by me doing that. It just came from applying scripture very directly toward so my good. spouse. Yeah, that's Philippians 4, 8, right? And it, it, and you're absolutely right. I love what you said because actually there was a time, there was a season in our marriage and our emotions are walk, 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 you know, they're all over the place. And there was a season where I just was very disgruntled and everything he did got on my nerves. And I just, just I don't know, it's just life. I don't even know why. It's something hormonal with me, I'm sure. But you know, the scripture talks about God keeping a book of remembrance yeah. and that he remembers when we talk about him and, you know, the, the things. So I actually did that ex just pretty much exactly what you're talking about. I got a notebook and I just challenged myself every day to write two or three things about him that I liked and that were good and, you know, focusing on those types of things. And it changed so much for me just in writing that because then we were conquering evil with good you know we were taking the thought captive and replacing it with the truth and what was praiseworthy and that is very powerful i love that i love that so much all right any resource obviously all of your books they're everywhere they're on amazon i will link to all the ones that we mentioned is there a specific resource you really want to point listeners to well, you've, you've mentioned the book, Loving Him Well, which is my book specifically for wives. Uh, their Sacred Marriage, which started it all off. I just wrote a book with a female counselor named Deborah Faleta called uh, Married Sex, a Christian nice. Couple's Guide to Reimagining Your Love Life. Nice. And so with a woman's perspective and a man's perspective, a counselor's perspective, a pastor's perspective, um, we wanted to just give a resource. So if the sexual intimacy was an issue that wives are thinking we'd like to put some more imagination in, uh, that would be a good resource for them as well. And you can find all of that information on my website, which is GaryThomas.com. Nice. And reading that book could be a way to love your husband well, right? <laughs> well, I don't think he'll be displeased if he sees his <laughs> wife with that book on her table. That's so good. That's awesome. All right. Well, how, where can my people find you if they want to connect with you? Yeah. GaryThomas.com is the website. It's got a link to Twitter and Facebook and Instagram. And we're just about to open up a new Substack blog and they'll find a link there. So uh, GaryThomas.com is the first place to go. Awesome. Thank you so, so much for doing this. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Jenny. All right, guys, told you he is so awesome. That conversation was so amazing. Even just doing the editing of this episode, I loved it all over again. I will probably listen to this one a lot. So if you were listening and you thought of someone who might really enjoy this, may or may not be your spouse, <laughs> whoever it is, would you just send it over to them? Shoot them a text. Enjoy the rest of your day, and I will catch you in two weeks. Hey friend, if you enjoyed this episode and you got some good stuff out of it, there's a few options you have. One, you could click that little subscribe button because let's be honest, who's got time to remember to 
check back and see if there's a new episode, right? So click that subscribe button and then when a new episode comes up, it will just by the magic of the internet pop up in your Dropbox and it'll be right there for you whenever you're ready. And also, if you would review this podcast, oh my gosh, if you like what you heard, get on there, give it a five star review. If you didn't like what you heard, just pretend it never happened, okay? <laughs> but if you would do um, a review for me, just take a couple seconds and do that. Not only would I be crazy excited, but also it would just be a great way for us to partner together for you to help this podcast be seen by more women out there. And you could be a part of helping more women discover these practical ways to apply God's word to just everyday stuff. So I would love it, love it, love it if you could help me out in one of those two ways. Mm -hmm.